Chapter 4 of Seminar 18 does some terrific synthetic work in Lacan's thought. It'll bring us eventually to some analytic implications, but first and foremost, I want to highlight some of the synthetic work that Lacan is doing in Chapter 4. And in fact, what I want to do is kind of provide you with two synthetic bookends, and then we'll dig into some of the meat of this chapter, at least as I read it. And it is a rather meaty one. First and foremost, at the start of chapter four, Lacan cues up a pretty familiar at this point split, a combat, if you will, between philosophy and mathematics. Let me read it to you, just to give you a sense of what's at stake here. And it's a stake that we've seen before. If you've got the PDF in front of you that we're working with, the page in question is page 58 of the broader PDF. If you're looking at the French, it'll probably also start on page 58 and go into page 59, where Lacan starts queuing up a certain number of philosophical statements, which he says find themselves in a way devalorized in principle by the fact that they are not dot, 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 that they give no graspable result as regards a search for meaning. So here what he's getting ramped up here is a critique of philosophy. In other words, if a philosophical text is caught red-handed in nonsense, it is ruled out for that very reason. And Lacan perceives this ruling out in the discourse of philosophy, a very traditional, rational conception of philosophy, as a weakness. It is only too clear that this is a way of pruning away the things that scarcely allows us to find our way. Because if we start from the principle that something that has no meaning cannot be essential in the development of a discourse, we quite simply lose our bearings. Now, when he says we, I think it's important to read this as we psychoanalysts, students of the unconscious, listeners, fans of the unconscious, if you will. Philosophy comes up short in the task of understanding the unconscious in all of its nonsensical expressions. That's one way to read this, and it's a very familiar one. I'm not saying, of course, Lacan continues, that such a requirement is not a procedure, but that this procedure forbids us in any, in a way, any articulation whose meaning is not graspable. And that, for him, is why philosophical discourse in this high modern rationalistic sense is weak because it forbids the psychoanalyst in any way from making sense of articulations whose meanings are not graspable. So here on the side of philosophy, you have a significant weakness from Lacan's point of view and not one of these weaknesses that redoubles as power because philosophy has no way to account for signifiers who are, whose meanings are not graspable. In other words, for nonsense. Now, if you've read any post-war French social theory, you know that philosophy can indeed be made to accommodate nonsense. But Lacan here is working with a traditional modern understanding of Western thought based on rationality, standards of cogency, coherence, um, and, and the like. And what he's saying here is that the inability of these discourses to make sense of signifiers whose meanings are not readily graspable, immediately graspable, is a site of weakness. Now notice where he goes from here. The key sentence, the turning point sentence, I'll read again. I'm not saying, of course, that such a requirement is not a procedure, but that this procedure of forbidding any discussion of nonsensical signifiers, it forbids us in any way, in a way, any articulation whose meaning is not graspable. This is something which, for example, may culminate in the fact, for example, that we can no longer make use of mathematical discourse. And notice what he's doing here with as the, the shift from philosophy to mathematics which on the admission of the most qualified logicians is characterized by the fact that it may be that at one or other of its points, we can no longer give it any meaning. 
Now, what he's suggesting here is that mathematics is barred from philosophical discourse insofar as in mathematical discourse, we oftentimes encounter at one or other points in this discourse signifiers whose meanings are not graspable. And from the philosophical vantage point that Lacan's portraying here, perhaps as a straw man, this renders mathematical discourse nonsensical. It's barred. Which, Lacan says, does not prevent math from being precisely, among all the discourses, the one that is developed with most rigor. So now he's shifting away from philosophy and towards an understanding of mathematics. Again, one that's pretty familiar to us in reading Lacan's late 1960s work, especially coming out of Seminar 14, where you see him really starting to ramp up post-Cantorian set theory in his work. So philosophy bars mathematical discourse, and yet it's precisely in mathematical discourse that we see something more than what philosophy traditionally gives us, namely a rigorous, coherent, and logical way to account for points in discourse where discourse no longer yields any meaning, where signifiers do not lend themselves to readily graspable significance. This is why he says, even though philosophy bars mathematics, nevertheless, we see mathematics precisely among all the discourses being the one that is developed with most rigor. We find ourselves, moreover, because of this fact, at a point that is quite essential to highlight concerning the function of writing. And that's the new part that he's adding to this. There's something about the function of writing that is illuminated by the way that mathematics proceeds when it offers these rigorous, coherent, logical accounts of signifiers whose meanings are not readily graspable. In mathematics, in other words, we find signifiers of nonsense. And Lacan thinks that is much more akin to analytic experience, much more useful to psychoanalytic theory and technique than anything that comes out of a hyper-rationalist philosophical discourse where nonsense precludes the possibility of further movement. In mathematics and in psychoanalysis, let me be clear, we are able to designate and develop rigorous, robust theoretical accounts for signifiers whose meanings are not readily graspable. So, long story short, philosophy versus mathematics. Lacan's money is on mathematics. And the important point here that we know is that it's set theory, notably the set theoretical notion of the empty set that Lacan has in mind. This is where our series on Seminar 16 ends, because it follows Lacan right through Seminar 16 to his end, which is set theory and this kinship between objet a and the empty set. You can go back and review those lectures. They will be top of mind in this discussion of Chapter 4 as well. So in Seminar 16, you get a very clear sense of Lacan siding with mathematics in this way. And then we get a further taste of this in Seminar 17, where Lacan talks about radical, logical systems being systems that can name their limits, that can designate the points beyond which their apparatus can proceed no further. That, for him, is quintessential to psychoanalytic theory. So, here, in Chapter 4 of Seminar 18, we get a synthetic account of stuff that we've already heard before from Lacan around philosophy, but precisely mathematics. I believe that this thought finds a bookend about 10 pages later in the manuscript of chapter or of seminar 18 that we're looking at, particularly on page 69. And I want to focus on this just to give you another bookend before we get to the meat that I believe is in the middle. So check out page 69 of the PDF that we're working with. It's just after Lacan has drawn this oddly cellular looking image, brings up Charles Sanders' purse, which flows quite oddly, but interestingly, from his discussion of totem and taboo. 
and the myth that is inscribed in there that, according to Lacan, is entirely invented by Freud of the primordial father insofar as he enjoys all the women. This is the bookend I want to call your attention to. And I say it's synthetic, I say it's review, because it's also something that we lavished attention upon in our series on Seminar 17, where Lacan also cues this up. So it's no surprise, the guy thinks this way, in a recursive fashion, that he's cueing up this myth of the father of the primordial horde insofar as he enjoys all the women. We've been there, but what Lacan wants to add here is some sort of a mathematical account of how this works in keeping with what we just heard about mathematics and its ability to designate nonsense. So you move from this paragraph where he introduces totem and taboo again through the stuff on Charles Sanders' purse, and then at the top of page 69, you get this, which I believe is this other bookend, where Lacan returns to this myth of the father of the primal horde. I quote, What the myth of the enjoyment of all the women designates is that there are not all the women. There is no universal of the woman. Here is what is posed by a questioning of the phallus which gives you a clue as to the type of meat that I believe is between these two bookends, and not of sexual relationship as regards what is involved in the enjoyment it constitutes, because I said that it was feminine enjoyment. So here the synthetic turn is a nice little summary of what happens in the 10 pages between these two bookends that I'm carving out for you, pages 58 to 69 of chapter 4, in the manuscript version of Seminar 18 that we're looking at. It's all right here. What the myth of the enjoyment of all the women designates, it's in italics, is that there are not all the women. There is no universal of the woman. Now, I know where you want to go with this. I know what you're thinking right now. This is absolutely prefiguring some stuff that's going to pop a couple years later in Seminar 20. But don't go there quite yet. That's an insight to be earned. Notice this last bit where it all comes together. Here is what is posed by a questioning of the phallus. That's our first agenda item. And not of sexual relationship, our second agenda item. As regards what is involved in the enjoyment it constitutes, that's our third action item, because I said that it was feminine enjoyment. That could be our fourth. We'll see if we get there. On one hand, Lacan is indeed prefiguring some insights that you'll see in Seminar 20. But I prefer to read this statement against the enjoyment of all the women as a set theoretical problem. I think it's a safer bet at this point, not to suggest that what we're getting from Lacan here is a prefiguration of things to come, but instead to mark this as a transition from things past, an understanding of set theory relative to the big other, etc., to society that we saw beginning in seminar 14 and really continuing up through 16 into 17 into here. The set theoretical problem here is that daddy can enjoy women one at a time, maybe multiple at a time, but the idea that daddy could enjoy all the women as a totality, as a category in which all women are included, a totalizing set, if you will, doesn't make any sense. Now, on the one hand, it doesn't make any damn sense logistically. One man in this hilarious myth and all the women. How many women can you pile into a bedroom with one man? And how much enjoyment can really be had? How many women can one man enjoy at once? So you start thinking through this kind of like logistically, heteronormatively. Lacan is playing with this stuff to be sure. It's partly why he thinks that myth is just kind of fucking ridiculous. Again, a point of ridiculousness that he makes good use of in Seminar 17. That is in focus here. 
but let's consider this from a set theoretical point. His point is that all women, the category that contains all women, is something that daddy can't enjoy. So it's not just a mathematical problem that Don Juan, in his serial enjoyment of one woman at a time, think again where Seminar 20 begins, tries to combat. What we see here is the dilemma of the master, I'm sorry, the father, enjoying all women as a totalizing set, the set that is the totality of women in the harem or whatever the hell you'd want to call it. There is no universal of the woman. Again, the way I would read that, just for purposes of clarity as a transition from Lacan's previous thought, is he's thinking about the total categorization of the woman. Now, I'm telling you, it definitely puts us on the path to 20, but I think it's more useful to hedge our bets a little bit here in seminar 18 and talk about this in terms of set theory as a mathematical problem. And what he wants to say here is that somehow this inability, this incapacity of the father to enjoy the category known as all women puts us on the path of understanding the phallus, not of a sexual relationship, but the symbolic phallus, as it's sometimes referred to, which really just means the phallic function, which is the function of castration, which is the function of a signifier that has no signified. Now, that's a lot, but it points us to the meat between these two brackets that we want to start working toward all in accordance with what he's doing here at the level of set theory. And here it is, to anticipate where we're headed. The phallus here is not the imaginary phallus. It's the symbolic phallus. But really, the symbolic phallus doesn't even capture what's up here. It's the phallic function. Is the name of daddy's inability, daddy's incapacity, to enjoy all these women. The enjoyment that this phallus names, the theoretical, hypothetical, non-existent enjoyment of the totalizing set known as all women, the enjoyment that the father is unable to access because the father cannot enjoy the category of all women, strictly speaking, does not exist. That's what he's doing with enjoyment here and that which is constituted by the phallus as a signifier. We're going to come to all this. We're going to explain all this. Right now, I'm just laying it out for us as we get into chapter 4 here. The enjoyment named by the phallus and the phallic function does not exist. In fact, if you recall what we did with sexual enjoyment, because that's what he's talking about here, in seminar 17, we can say a few things that might be provocative. If you've seen our series, you probably think this is redundant at this point. The closest this enjoyment of all women, the closest the father comes to this enjoyment is at the level of its prohibition, at the level of his incapacity to access it, in incapacity signified. In fact, what I would say is the closest this enjoyment comes to existence is this very statement, namely that sexual enjoyment only exists in and as a prohibition, in and as prohibited, in and as an exclusion from the field of existence, from the field of sociolinguistic order known as the symbolic. So now here you can see the connection between what Lacan's doing in Seminar 16 around enjoyment as excluded from the field of the big barred other. That's what the big barred other fundamentally lacks because it lacks a body, the same body that we drag along with us. Jouissance is excised from the field of the big barred other, and it is a constitutive excision. This is stuff we covered in Seminar 16, but it's also readily apparent here around this type of sexual enjoyment. It is constitutively excised from the field of the symbolic, from existence. Let me be as precise as possible here. 
sexual enjoyment is prohibited. If it is, it only exists as prohibited. It's not like we had it once and then we lost it and now we're trying to regain sexual enjoyment. No, it only exists as an ever-distant horizon, as a barrier in our road beyond which we cannot pass. That's Lacan's point about sexual enjoyment versus surplus enjoyment that you've heard so often in lectures on Lacan these past few months as we're working through seminars 17 and now into 18. Sexual enjoyment only exists as prohibited, as prohibition. Make no mistake, though, as we reach back into seminars 16, as we reach back into seminars 17, we are still right here on the trail of a discourse that might not be a semblance. In other words, of a real discourse. What else is the statement, sexual enjoyment is prohibited, but a sign marker on the path to real discourse? Nevertheless, this bit about the phallus and not of sexual relationship that we just heard at the top of page 69 is really quite relevant. And it puts us right on the pathway into the core of chapter four, or at least as I read chapter four of seminar 18. And what I mean by this is it carries us right to the most challenging conceptual turn in this chapter, which occurs when Lacan attempts to show why, quote, there is no sexual relationship in the speaking being. Now, you can again anticipate Seminar 20 here. You can also read there is no sexual relationship right back from Seminar 14 forward, as we've done. What's important for us here, the part I want to call our attention to, is how Lacan attempts to show this. Namely, by returning to his understanding of the phallus, the symbolic phallus, namely the phallic function. So let's be clear here. Traditionally speaking, in Lacan's thought, we often talk about two different types of phalluses. Phalloi, phallata, phalluses. There's the imaginary phallus, which we've spent lots of time talking about. Here is the phallus as an imaginary object, that which is lost in castration or symbolic alienation. Here is the phallus as a centerpiece of castrative logics as depicted in this myth, another great one, of the Oedipus complex. Here in Lectures on Lacan, we've often depicted the imaginary phallus as part and parcel of a transition, an infantile experience, from imaginary triangles to symbolic squares. Now, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about here, and you know the diagram work that we've done in previous series. So I'll leave it at that also leaving it at that because this is not what Lacan is talking about when he mentions the phallus in chapter 4 of seminar 18. What he means instead is the second type of phallus that we typically see bandied about in Lacanian discussions, namely the, quote, symbolic phallus, the so-called symbolic phallus. I don't quite like that characterization as much for reasons I'll try to tell you in a second. The symbolic phallus, as is traditionally understood, is not central to the Oedipus complex. It's central to the question of sexual difference with both male and female subjects assuming their sexes by way of the symbolic phallus. And you can imagine, you probably already know, the particular images that correspond with this. The imaginary phallus is depicted as the lowercase Greek phi, and the symbolic phallus is oftentimes written in all caps. I hold these images up so that you can see them in order to jog your mind, because that's really what is at stake here. Not the jogging of your mind, but the writing down and the holding up as a substitute, perhaps, for what I'm saying. Maybe even an origin of what I'm saying, if we start taking Lacan seriously around the notion of writing. And I don't quite take him seriously around the notion of writing yet. At this point in seminar 18, I do not yet take him seriously around writing. 
I think I have a sense of what he's up to, and I'm not entirely wowed. Not yet. For whatever the fuck that is worth. Here, what we're looking at with the symbolic phallus is oftentimes depicted as a signifier that can't be negated. Unlike the imaginary phallus, right? Castration is a negation of that phi. That phi becomes minus phi in the castrative logic known as symbolic alienation. Not so with the symbolic phallus. That shit can't be negated. We can talk about that later in terms of why that is. The point I want to get at, though, is that what distinguishes the symbolic phallus, if we can even call it that, is that it's a certain type of signifier. It's a special type of signifier because it's a signifier without a signified. And here, it's tough to deny. This is exactly what Lacan says in 7R20. Now, we can talk about this as a signifier of lack in the barred other. You can write the word woman and then put a slash through it and get at some of this as well. What I want to emphasize, though, is that this odd signifier without a signified, what matters to Lacan here is its operation, its operational logic. How does this weird signifier without a signified work? In other words, we are less talking about the symbolic phallus than a symbol in the symbolic phallus of a phallic function, an operation of sorts. That's what's at stake when Lacan turns to the phallus here. It's a certain type of operation, an operation that he also likens to castration, suggesting that the phallic function of a signifier without a signified has something to do with the function of castration. Now, all allusions aside, let's take a step back and think about how we got here. Recall our series on Seminar 16, notably the lecture in that series on Chapter 21, where we developed this flux capacitor diagram. I think if you go to the YouTube playlist, for our series on Seminar 16, and you look for Chapter 21, I think even the image there is of the flux capacitor from the hilarious movie that Family Guy just can't seem to do without, known as Back to the Future. We developed this flux capacitor image with some very specific goals in mind in our series on Seminar 16. With this idea of a phallic function, as a function of castration, the so-called symbolic phallus, where we positioned it right at the navel of that flux capacitor, the navel of sorts between knowledge, think the big barred other, enjoyment as subtracted from the field of knowledge, think negative J, and subjectivity, think barred subjectivity. And so if you wanted to draw this out in keeping with the diagrams that we worked with and we worked up in seminar 16, it looks something like this. Thinking in terms of the flux capacitor, you would have the barred subject and the big barred other. And you can recall all the diagram work that we had built on top of that. And then you've got what's excised from both of them, jouissance, hence the negative J here. The symbolic phallus, or again better, the phallic function, is what occurs here at this meeting point, which is why I call it a navel. Not the only reason why I call it a navel. Let me tell you, this entire discussion of chapter 4 around this symbolic phallus and the phallic function, it comes from the great insight of one of the senior clinicians who joined us from London at our last meeting, our last discussion, our discussion of chapters 1 and 2 in seminar 18, which brought us right to the navel of the dream. And you know what I'm talking about, and you know who said it if you were in the call. And let me tell you, it was mind-opening. The simplicity and the profundity of that remark cinched so much together. That's what you see here. The phallic function, as symbolized by this largish figure, this all-caps figure that Lacan often uses, it marks a navel 
it marks a dead zone of sorts, which we'll describe in a moment. And again, if you look at the flux capacitor in this hilarious film, Back to the Future, this is the point we were making back toward the end of seminar 16, is that what you see is that these three lines between the barred subject, the big barred other, and the excision of jouissance that constitutes each of them as barred, there is no connection. There is a dead zone in the flux capacitor, which is again why that image lends itself so nicely to the work that we were doing back then. Knowledge, enjoyment, and subjectivity all bump up against this dead zone in the field of signifying articulation that we as good Lacanians use the phallus in the sense of the symbolic phallus in the sense of the phallic function to designate. Now, a lot of this is review, which is partly why I'm moving a little bit quick through this material. But let's see if we can put a top line on this. What did this yield, all of this bizarre diagrammatic work that we did in our series on Seminar 16? To sum up, again, thinking synthetically here, we defined the symbolic phallus as a symbol or designator of the inner extimate limit of the signifying process, where the barred subject, we said, quoting Lacan, aims at subtractions of sexual enjoyment. And by that, I mean sites and signifiers of that famous forbidden enjoyment that Lacan goes on to discuss in Seminar 17. In the field of the symbolic of society, not the big other here, but the big barred other. So you get this connection between the barred subject and the big barred other. Both barred because both are structured atop excisions of jouissance, both of which endure sexual enjoyment only as prohibition. And something happens when the barred subject aims at this point in the big barred other where you can see J negated, enjoyment subtracted, sites and signifiers of forbidden enjoyment, Statements where we hear things like, sexual enjoyment is prohibited here. What then does the barred subject use when it aims at these signifiers of lack in the big barred other? This lack of jouissance, sexual jouissance, that barred subjects and barred others alike sustain in order to exist. What does the barred subject sound like in these moments. The speech of the barred subject when it aims at subtractions of sexual jouissance in the field of the big barred other sound like symptoms. They are symptomatic expressions. The speech of the barred subject is symptomatic speech. Indirect, but nevertheless symptomatic speech. Let me be categorical here. The phallic signifier is the missing signifier in the battery of signifiers that the subject names in their symptomatic expressions, or at least links up with. I'm willing to leave that part open at this point. I think it might be more productive to leave that last bit open than to close it down. The phallic signifier is the missing signifier in a battery of signifiers that the subject names and thus signifies in their symptomatic expressions, or at least links up with this missing signifier. You see, in the field of the symbolic, a missing signifier can also be signified. It also receives signification. There are signifiers of absence. You don't need to think too hard on this point to get it. When you show up at a class and the person you were hoping to sit next to is not present, their absence is noticeable. Social science has a name for this. It's called noticeable absence. It's a, it's a nonverbal cue. When you don't show up to a meeting where you are expected, your absence is significant. It signifies. There's a signifier of absence. You can read it as the empty seat next to the one in which you're sitting. But nevertheless, absence itself receives signifiers in the field of the symbolic. And that's partly why we say the symbolic phallus can't be negated. Because even if you negate a certain entity, that negation itself is a positivization in the field of the symbolic. Now that's a little bit 
techno nerd stuff. We don't really need to get into all that in order to see this point. Again, a point that has to do with belly buttons. What I said about this navel of sorts, this missing signifier at which the barred subject in moments of symptomatic expression aims, this navel of sorts, what I said about this in our lecture on chapter 21 in seminar 16, inviting you once again to go back and check it out, is also precisely, and nothing more, than what Lacan says about it there in chapter 21. Check it out. The missing signifier in the field of the big barred other that the subject names in symptomatic expressions marks a void, a null point, what Lacan calls, and I quote, a point of impossibility in the sociolinguistic field known as the symbolic. That's why I'm toying with the notion of the navel, of course, the navel of the dream, the point at which analysis, interpretation, meaning-making begins to shut down, the nonsensical point. Lacan would eventually get us to the synthome for this. We'll get there when we get there. But now, at this point, what we're looking at is a point of impossibility. And the question is, what signifiers correspond to that point of impossibility? And how do these signifiers operate? Lacan even gets a little wilder with this in the early bits of chapter 21 in Seminar 16. By way of review, I'll remind you. This void, null point, this point of impossibility, think real, in the sociolinguistic field known as the symbolic, the big barred other, etc. Lacan calls this a point at the infinity of everything that is organized in the order of signifying combinations. It is a point at the infinity. What is this infinity but the infinity of truth? The phallus in question here, you've heard me say, is a signifier without a signified. Why? Because what it signifies is impossible for the symbolic to account for. And it's an impossibility which this signifier, when it pops up, nevertheless clearly states. And all the more so when the subject pops in with symptomatic expressions of the fact that they, like the big barred other, are nothing more and nothing less than effect structures of enjoyment's constitutive exclusion, its prohibition from both systems, self and society, subject and symbolic alike. At some point, what we're referring to here is the basic law of normative social order. Enjoy as little as possible. This signifier without a signified has a function within the field known as the symbolic. And it's that operation, that function, that we're trying to suss out here. And again, don't, don't get it twisted. We are absolutely still on the path of real discourse. So here's the question. Here we are in a seminar that deals very heavily with the notion of discourse. Is it possible to locate this signifier without a signified because it's signified is impossible? Is it possible to locate this signifier of impossibility in Lacan's theory of discourse? And if so, where should we put it? A clue comes to us on page 66 of the PDF of Seminar 18 that we're working with, which is also 60, 66 in the original French, if you want to check it out, I believe. It's a few pages before the passage we read regarding that bizarre myth that Freud propagates in Totem and Taboo. Page 66 is the one we're looking for. The paragraph begins really at the bottom of the page, the second half of page 66. And what it suggests is that if we're looking for a place to locate the so-called phallus that Lacan is queuing up here in chapter four of seminar 18, 
we need look no further than the delta of impotence functioning as a logical obstacle in his broader topology of discourse, where you see this delta of impotence as a logical obstacle between what is produced by any given discourse and the truth atop which that production is facilitated through the speech of an agent addressing another, if you want the full rest of the sentence there. Check it out. It is necessary, Lacan says in the second part of 66, after introducing the notion of the phallus, just above it. It is necessary to distinguish what is involved in this intrusion of the phallus from what some people thought they could express by the term lack of signifier. It is not the lack of signifier that is at stake, but the obstacle raised to a relationship. There's that magic word, obstacle, at stake in the phallic function is not so much a signifier, but the function of a signifier that raises an obstacle to a relationship, imposes a barrier of sorts. The phallus, by emphasizing an organ does not designate, does not in any way designate the organ described as the penis with its physiology, nor even the function that one may faith attribute to it with some verisimilitude as being that of copulation. So, check it out. The meat you've heard me refer to between the bookends of this combat between philosophy and math and this wild myth that Freud propagates and Lacan makes the most of, of the father of the primal horde, so-called enjoying all the women. Between those two bookends, the meat in question, it ain't the meat known as the penis. And nor does it point to this material embodied act of copulation. The symbolic phallus, like all phalluses in Lacan's thought, are I hesitate to say metaphorical, I prefer figurative. Because they are figures, they function as signifiers. We are not talking about male anatomy here. That's his point about the phallus. The obstacle posed here is not that of the penis with its physiology, nor even the function of the penis in the field of physiological acts known as copulation. On the contrary, it aims in the least ambiguous way, if one refers to analytic texts, at its relationship to enjoyment. That's the key question. The phallus that introduces an obstacle into a relationship doesn't have anything to do with the sexual act as a material bodies pressed against each other entity. It has to do with the relation that that act has to enjoyment, the relation between the so-called sexual rapport and this notion of enjoyment, by which he means forbidden, prohibited sexual enjoyment. And maybe it's useful here to just tell you exactly what he means by sexual enjoyment. Sexual enjoyment as wholeness, completion, consistency, closure, and the like. Identity, not identification, identity. That's what he means by sexual enjoyment. That's what's prohibited. To be a barred subject is to live a life where completion, wholeness, consistency are all prohibited. That's the type of enjoyment he's talking about. The enjoyment that would come if we were able to be complete. Not to attain completion, but to be complete. Completion can be attained in the field of fantasy. The question will become, incidentally, between being and having here in a moment. But for now, let's just be clear about what that enjoyment is in question here. The question of the phallus's relation to enjoyment, the phallus here as the symbolic phallus, and the enjoyment in question as sexual enjoyment, as only ever prohibited. And this is how they distinguish it from the physiological function. There is, this is what is posited as constituting the function of the phallus. There is an enjoyment 
which constitutes in this relationship different from the sexual relationship what what we will call its condition of truth. Now that last bit, just like the last bit on writing that we heard in one of the previous paragraphs around mathematics, this last bit, its condition of truth, that's a wild little ending there. Let's just focus on the substance that is leading up to this. The enjoyment in question is a sexual enjoyment. And the sexual enjoyment in question has nothing to do with the physical acts of copulation that we typically would understand as occurring in a sexual relationship. Now, that might be overly simplistic, but it allows Lacan to start making that very classic distinction between the phallus and the penis, which unfortunately is still like all too often lost. And you know who's to blame for this? Fucking Lacan. Why you got to choose the phallus? Why you got to choose an anatomically equivalent substitute for penis? There are reasons for this, but I think it only makes things more difficult. When he says phallus here, he means signifier. It's a special signifier that serves a special function because it doesn't signify anything. It doesn't have a signified. Why? Because what it would refer to is something that only exists as prohibited. If there were a referent, even, for, if we want to just be wild with this, for the phallus here, this referent sexual jouissance, it doesn't exist, so you can't have a referent. And it only signifies, it only has meaning as prohibited. So the signifier that would designate this prohibition has to be a weird one. That's his point here. Reading on to the next page where he goes on to develop this argument and brings us to that point around being and having that I wanted to flag for you. I'd say you're about 10 lines down on page 67 of the PDF, just after the italicized reference to the direction of the treatment and the principles of its power. Here's what he says. The phallus is the organ insofar as it is. It is being that is at stake insofar as it is, dot, 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 feminine enjoyment. This is where and in what there resides the incompatibility of being and having. An incompatibility that is deeply, profoundly akin to the effects of castration. Now, what a weird sentence to throw out here. What the hell are we to make of this? Here's how I'm reading it. Just as Lacan wants to pull his notion of the phallus away from the anatomical structure, the physiology of the penis, so also does he want to pull the function of the phallus away from the copulative participants known as male and female. It's not male and female that are at stake here, but instead having and being. That's partly what he's doing. As he says, the phallus is not the penis, and its effect is not on relationships between men and women. Its effect has to do with the operations known as having and being. And the way that the phallus as a signifier of the impossible, namely a signifier of one's own castration, shh, don't tell anybody, makes the functions of having and being incompatible. So that's what happens here. The phallus, as a very specific signifier, stands in between and thus renders incompatible the line of existence known as having and the line of existence known as being. It goes in between these two things. What the phallus does, Lacan goes on to say, on the very same page, you can actually quote him through some of this, is it marks a gap or an opening, an irreducible distance between these two functions of having and being. Check it out. It's worth reading, just so you have the passage in front of you. It's the paragraph that begins on page 67, um, also 67 if you're looking at the French. What I am proposing is the following. 
it is to posit that we will put language here, Juan, in its reserved field in this gap of the sexual relationship as the phallus leaves it open. Now, don't stress on the language bit, the number one or the little diagram to the right. We'll get to it when we get to it. Right now, what we're looking at is this gap that is effected introduced into the so-called sexual rapport by the phallus as a signifier without a signified, because what it signifies is the impossible. The phallus leaves it open by positing that what it introduces here is not, not two terms that are defined as male and female. So we're not talking about male and female anymore. But this choice between these terms of a quite different nature and function that are called being and having. What proves, what supports, what renders this distance absolutely obvious, definitive, is the following, Lacan concludes. Something whose difference it does not seem people have noticed is the substitution for the sexual relationship of what is called sexual law. So we are not talking about penises. We are not talking about the copulative participants known as male and female. We are instead talking about a certain signifier known as the phallus that introduces a gap, totally displacing the sexual rapport between two operational logics, being and having, that for Lacan are way more foundational here. The, the so-called sexual relationship when the phallus intrudes, as we've heard Lacan say in this chapter, it, is, it dissipates. It falls apart, revealing at its core, at its structure, being and having. And what we see in place of the so-called sexual relationship now is a sexual law, is what Lacan says. What is this sexual law? that is imposed when the phallus is introduced between being and having. This is precisely the sexual law that finds expression when we hear things like sexual enjoyment is prohibited here, that sexual enjoyment only exists as this prohibition, forbidden, and the like. Instead of the so-called sexual rapport, we now have this prohibition against anything like union, anything like completion, anything like consistency. The prohibition against sexual jouissance is always the imposition of a certain sexual law. This is what Lacan is working at here. So if you read on past this bit about the sexual law, you'll now see what he's doing. It is here that there is this distance in which it is inscribed, inscribed no less, the law must be written down, that there is nothing in common between what, we can, what can be stated as a relationship which lays down the law in the form of inscription insofar as it derives in some form or other from the application that a mathematical function circumscribes most closely. Yeah, don't even try and use mathematics to get at this. Philosophy would be so much better. Oh, wait a minute. We have to turn that fucking standard Lacanianism on its head. Lacan ain't got shit to do with philosophy at this point. The discourse in question is mathematics. The discipline, the department down the hall from the department of Lacanian psychoanalysis, it is not philosophy. It's mathematics. Mathematics is the discipline right next door to psychoanalysis. And that's what he's queuing up here. He's reminding everybody that no matter how philosophical this shit sounds, what he's fundamentally dealing with is something that math, the mathematical discourse, helps us understand. The application that a mathematical function circumscribes most closely, so it's not philosophy, no matter how philosophical this sounds, that's in question. It's the discourse of mathematics and its quasi-mathematical sibling psychoanalysis that can help us designate 
how this law is laid down, where it's laid down, what it looks like and what it sounds like, and how it operates in the field of signifying articulation. And a law that is coherent to the whole register of what is called desire, of what is called prohibition, of what underlines that it is from the very gap of the inscribed prohibition, the law that is laid down on the page, that there derives the conjunction, indeed the identity, as I dared state, of this desire and of this law. We'll come to that. We know from our readings of Seminar 10 forward that desire equals the law. There is no difference between the law and desire. You can go back and review those materials. We'll certainly touch upon it when we get back to the discourse of the master, but he's throwing this out as a reminder of this bizarre identity, equi equivalence, if you will, between desire and the law. And what is posited correlatively for everything that derives from the effect of language, from everything that establishes the dimension of the truth from a structure of fiction. Now, this brings us right to the second book and, and with which we started this discussion, the bit on totem and taboo. It's in the very next paragraph that he introduces this. But again, it's this little bit at the end that really gives us pause. Not so much the notion of dimension. Okay, the abode, the mansion, the dimension of, it's this latter bit, the truth that matters for us. And so what I want you to do as you're thinking through this stuff, recall that what is at stake here is a profound understanding of the truth, of the real, of the impossible. And in each case, we're looking at how signifiers play into that. The fact that there's a part of truth that can be said in speech and a part that can't. The fact that the real has a name in the field of the symbolic. That the phallus is a unique signifier because it doesn't have a signified because what it signifies is impossible. We're dealing with signifiers that are operating in a very peculiar way. As you imagine this, and as it relates to what he's doing with being and having, I want you to think the bottom half of Lacan's theory of discourse, where you have truth in the bottom left, and you've got production in the bottom right. And then between them, you've got this delta of impotence that we've been talking about. And I would ask you to transmute that into a couple of Eulerian circles. You know the kind of classic... Lacanian circles that look something like this. These overlapping circles also very important to set theoretical lines of inquiry. I would ask you to put in these two circles on the right side having on the left side in the left circle right being this dimension of truth on the left. On the right, with having, I think you can talk about production. You can talk about the cause of desire. You can talk about phallic enjoyment on the right-hand side in the field of having. Having what is produced at the level of a commodity and thereby experiencing, you know where I'm going with this, surplus enjoyment. Here in the field of desire, in the field of production, which is the lower right-hand quadrant of any Lacanian theory of discourse, we see having. Having what? Having stuff. Having commodities. Things that can be enjoyed in a surplus fashion. Here is one of the origins of phallic enjoyment, phallic jouissance, right here in the field of surplus enjoyment, on the side of having. And don't get it twisted, because Women in this wild myth from Freud are precisely among the commodities to be had. On the left-hand side, in the left-hand circle of these overlapping Eulerian spheres, we have the dimension of truth. We have not having but being. And at the risk of putting too much 
in this category, I would suggest that it's here that we find feminine enjoyment, as Lacan is understanding it at the start of Seminar 18. Now, with those two circles fleshed out in your mind, having production, phallic jouissance, surplus jouissance, desire on the right, the dimension of truth, of being, of feminine enjoyment, of castration, as split subjects endure it, on the left, we can now ask the more important question, the question that has been at stake since Lacan introduced this interjecting phallus. Where do we put the phallus? You know where it needs to go at this point. It goes in between, at the point where these two circles overlap. This is where we put the phallic function. The phallic function as sexual law goes in between as an obstacle, a barrier, a prohibition, where sexual enjoyment as a union between these two spheres, if you want to think about this from the Greeks forward in various theories of love, is prohibited, is blocked, is forbidden. Instead of a sexual relationship, what these Eulerian circles indicate when they overlap at their field of overlapping is an obstacle, a barrier, a rupture of some kind, beyond which we cannot pass, beyond which discourse itself is abolished, beyond which there is only nothing. These are all riffs from Seminar 17 that I would suggest are very important to have in mind when Lacan cues this point up of the function of the phallus being to lay down the sexual law, the law which prohibits anything like sexual enjoyment, and thus sunders or creates this break, this incompatibility between having in the field of surplus enjoyment and production and being in this dimension of truth. And all of this occurring right in the bottom half of Lacan's theory of discourse, where you see truth and production divided by the delta of impotence. It is precisely there that the phallus lays down the sexual law.